Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our weekend organist uh, webinar tonight. I hope everyone got through the holiday season unscathed. It's such a busy time and a lot of stress, but I hope it was a, a rewarding time for you and, and your services went fantastic. But after Christmas comes New Year's, and we're still in that first week of the year. And our topic tonight is New Year's resolutions you can keep. I know some of you probably made some resolutions, but we're going to help you keep them. And not advancing. Before we begin, um, I just wanted to take a moment. I, I don't know if you may have heard either on the AGO's social channels or uh, in, in the news, but uh, we lost a, a real luminary on Christmas Day. And that's the composer and teacher and performer, Charles Callahan. Uh, for those of us that, that play uh, churches for a long time, I mean, he, he was very prolific and wrote so many works that uh, many of us have have played, and it's it's really funny. Our next webinar is going to be music for manuals, and I'd actually reached out to him to ask him if he might be a special guest. And unfortunately, he had he had been hospitalized and uh, passed away. So we we do remember Dr. Callahan, and uh, we will be talking about some of his works tonight, and especially in April for our music for manuals webinar. So we'll tell you more about that a little later. So what is a weekend organist? Uh, you might know that that I write the column in TAO uh, each month covering some of the topics that that come up for someone, but we're we're generally part-time church musicians. Uh, that might be anywhere from five hours to 20 or more hours a week, but we're pretty much part-time. Most of us are paid uh, either hourly or salaried, but we know that there are a lot of weekend organists who are also volunteers and that's great but that doesn't mean that you're any less professional in how you carry out your duties at the church many of us are self-taught or professionally trained we run the gamut and chances are most of us have a day job and my day job is serving as the marketing and communication specialist for the ago by day and as a, a marketing consultant and uh, by the weekend, I, I get to put on my organ shoes and, and do something I love equally as well. And as weekend organists, we typically have to do more with less because we've got a day job. Many of us have families and other commitments. So practice time sometimes is hard to find. Many times we play in smaller churches. Maybe our instruments are limited. We have to really think about how to use them to their best um, advantage. Budget. Again, in a smaller church coming out after COVID, so many churches were really hit by that. And so budget can be an issue. And also volunteers. Many, many of our choir members and our music colleagues didn't come back after the pandemic. Uh, I'll give you a great example. I had about eight or nine in my choir on a, a given Sunday and came back from COVID. And now I'm doing great when I have three. So it really does force us to be creative and to use our resources and stretch them. But here's the most important point. And I hope that no matter what your situation is, I hope you'll remember that you know, we may play in small churches, we may play part-time, we may have small choirs, but our music ministries are just as meaningful to our congregants as, as any big church with a full staff and paid choir. Uh, we're we're doing we're doing great work, and so I hope that you'll keep that in mind at all times. Even even when it gets stressful, even when it gets a little tough, it's it's important to remember that our our work has meaning and value. And just to give you a sense, uh, sixty percent of AGO members are part time or weekend organists. So it's we're actually the biggest demographic, I believe, in the AGO membership. And so it really is important that we do our best to meet the needs of, of the weekend organist. And here's a request I'm going to make of you. Um, we'd like to know more about you and uh, what you do at your church, how, how many hours you work a week, what, what resources would be helpful for you, what future programming would be beneficial. 
if you could take a few minutes, uh, my very capable assistant, Dan McCaffrey, who's the AGO's membership and technology coordinator, I believe is going to put the link to a survey monkey poll in the chat, and he'll he'll drop it in a couple of times over the course of the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes. It's it's short. It's 15 questions. Most of them are just check the box, but it's going to really help us to understand how we can help you. And that's the the number one priority for what I'm doing with the column and one of the priorities that we're placing on programming for AGO in general. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. New Year's resolutions. 27 million Americans made New Year's resolutions. And that's a, That's been a pretty consistent number from what the research that I've done. Um, 27 million Americans made resolutions. I'm sure that many of you did too, or at least made set goals for the year. But they might be things like lose weight, exercise more, eat better, quit smoking, get organized in the house. I mean, resolutions run all the whole range of, of uh, activities that we do every day. But what does what does a church musician make for a resolution? And I'm going out on a limb on this. I think that I think I may be right, but please feel free. The chat's enabled. Uh, jump in there if you'd like to share your resolutions. We'd love to see those as well. We can get some good conversation going in the chat. Twelve percent, just twelve percent of people who make those res resolutions stick with them for thirty days or longer. Is that shocking? I don't, I don't know. I, I hope not, but, but it seems, seems kind of reasonable. So we had all those millions, then we whittle it down and say bye-bye to 88% uh, of them. And that's, that's who's left. And that's 30 days is just a few days away. So what, what do musicians make resolutions about? And I, I'm going on the limb again. I, th I think it's the practice more. I know for me, that's one that that is always kind of in the back of my mind, uh, working hard during the week. And I always wish I could get more time into practice and do it better. And uh, so I'd be curious, is, is practice more one of your resolutions? Drop that into the chat and, and uh, engage in some conversation there. Um, but here's the thing with resolutions. And, and I think there's a reason why we fail at them. It's because one, we just don't hold ourselves accountable. We're not very specific about them. And so here's what I would propose to keep your resolution. And we're gonna talk about some different kinds later, but in the, in the consulting world, you may have heard of SMART objectives. Uh, they're, they're objectives for the business or for an organization. The S stands for specific. The M stands for measurable. The A stands for achievable, the R stands for relevant, and the T stands for time bound. And so if you think about that, practice more, there's a whole lot missing from that, isn't there? I mean, we're not, we're not really specific. We're not really measurable. I suppose it could be achievable, uh, relevant. I don't know. I mean, are, are you practicing the right stuff? Um, and then, of course, time bound. What's the time frame on that? Well, I'm going to practice more starting in October to get ready for Christmas. So as you can see, it doesn't always quite work for a New Year's resolution. But by taking these these concepts, these key key thoughts and applying them to your resolutions, you can actually make them happen. And I, I came up with five ways that you can keep that resolution that kind of fit with the SMART model. One is to learn or relearn a challenging work. The second, spice up your services. Three, earn AGO professional certification. Four, plan and present a recital. We're gonna have fun with that one in a little bit. And five, find a practice partner. And tonight we're going to take a look at all five of those. I touched on them a little bit in my column in the January issue, and tonight we're going to we're going to talk about them a little bit. We're going to look at some ideas because I only have so much space and so many words to fit into that page in the magazine, 
and uh, share some resources that can help make all of these uh, objectives happen for you. So let's talk about learning or relearning a challenging work. We don't wanna forget the SMART principles. We're specific. So what, what is the work that, that we'd like to do? Is it measurable? You know, how, do, how, do we, how do we determine that we've been successful? Is that, is, are we gonna perform it? Are we gonna use it in a church service? Is the, is the work achievable? Is it something that you really can master? Is it something that's relevant? Um, is it a work that, that either is good for a, a service setting or even just for fun? I mean, how, how is that work relevant for you? And of course, time bound. So if we're taking some of these, some of these pieces that we're thinking about, you know, can, we can be specific. I'm gonna learn the Vidor Toccata and I want to perform it for Easter for the postlude. And basically I've, I've hit those because I've been specific. I've named that work that I'd like to relearn. I've played the Vidor Toccata since 1994. So I, I can do it. It's, it's measurable because there's a performance. It's achievable. It's something that I have the technical ability for. It's relevant because it's a, for an Easter service, you know, which is a joyous setting. And I've set a time time bound for it. And I would say with this, it's okay to relearn a favorite work too, because you know sometimes we we need to build our confidence. And uh, I think that knowing that you've you've mastered something in the past, twenty years, thirty years, ten years ago, gives you the confidence to know, hey, I can get that back into my repertoire and and pull it off and uh, be successful. So, this is this is a very basic one. This I think this is one that all of us could do. Maybe maybe uh, if you've got some ideas of how you might apply this using those smart principles, drop those into the chat. I'm not seeing a whole lot of chatting, but I'm going to trust you. Uh, I I can't see the chat in presentation mode right now, but Dan is watching it, and if there are any questions that come up, he'll be sure to share those as well in the course of the webinar. And here's a great resource to help you make this happen. Uh, if you're if you're a member of the AGO Organ Forum, which is our closed group on Facebook, you're probably going to recognize Vitas Pinkovicius because he's the number one contributor to the group. He's a an organ professor, composer, performer in Lithuania, and has found a home in in our group and it just contributes so much. But one of the things I really love is that he has a website and a blog called The Secrets of Organ Playing. So it's a place where you can go and, and hear performances, get tips. He, he talks how to harmonize different kinds of scales and, and hymn tunes and, you know, very wonderful resource. It's a little bit beyond the basics of registration or, or peddling. It, it's actually real world applications. And the other piece that he has that I really love, because I gotta be honest, fingering is not my thing. It, it's really my weak point. And he, he's taken so many pieces and actually fingered and, and written down the pedaling for them. Uh, this is the Prelude and C Prelude and Fugue in C major by Bach uh, that I bought. I, I bought a um, Brahms Crawl Prelude as well for a project I'm working on that I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. But as you can see, he's worked out all the hard stuff and think about how much time you can save when you have the have the fingerings there right in front of you. So I hope you'll consider maybe this is the resolution for you in 2024. It's certainly achievable. Let's talk about the second suggestion. Spice up your services. Um, maybe maybe working a, a major work, getting that into shape is is maybe not feasible this year, but here's one that might be. And that's just find ways to incorporate new hymn introductions, reharmonizations, variations into your services on a regular basis. And we can we can do that smart, smart goal uh, applied to that just as easily. You know, rethink your registrations. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it's easy to kind of use the same ones week after week. And so make it a challenge this year to change it up a little bit. 
you know, vary your service music settings and uh, incorporate other instruments, uh, piano, organ and piano, or maybe maybe you can hop to the piano from time to time during the service to to add some variety if if the setting is right and it's a, it's a possibility. And here's one that really changed my life. Uh, record your rehearsals or watch your services if you stream them. Or maybe if you have a friend who's who's pretty capable on the organ, have them come over and play and just go to the back of the sanctuary and listen to the instrument. It really was eye-opening. I had the first opportunity to do that at my church in many, many years uh, just recently. And, and it it just really changed the way I think about how I, how I use the instrument and the services, just to be able to sit there and hear it. And so often the console may be right under kind of even a little bit below the pipes or it's off to the side, or maybe it's in a corner. And so you really don't get the sen the real sense of how the instrument sounds in your, in your sanctuary. And so this is, this is one of those things that you can make smart resolutions, make that resolution to uh, maybe, maybe, uh, do some variations on a hymn, one hymn each Sunday uh, for the year. That's that's pretty doable. Or maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, work with a soloist once a month or once a quarter. But but use those smart principles, and it's a great way to improve your your playing, give your practicing some focus, and also really benefit the. The members of your congregation and, and their worship experience as well. And I'd love to share some of my favorite resources with you. Uh, if you're on the last webinar, a couple of these may look familiar, but these are ones that I've just really fallen in love with. And the first is Charles Callahan's Art of Hymn Playing. There are two volumes that cover so many, so many hymn tunes. Uh, many of his arrangements don't have pedal which is a nice change too, because we're so used to always using the pedal. Or if, if pedaling is still a skill you're working on, it's a great way to spice up your service without, without running that risk of getting hung up with the pedaling. Um, John Benke, a, another one, Hymns Complete. What I love about this, this has a variation for every single verse of the hymn. So in the two volumes, and there's about 20, 20 different tunes. And he takes you through, and some of those Lutheran tunes that have like 10 and 11 verses, he's got a different arrangement for every single one of them. They're really fun. They work on small instruments as well as large instruments. Just really, really quality music. The other one's a book I've had forever. I think maybe since maybe since the late 80s when I was in college. This is the Crystal Cathedral Golden Collection. Uh, from Fred Bach music. And the, this is really all those wonderful arrangements that uh, Fred Swan used to improvise and Mark Thalander. And I think I may have misspelled Mark's last name. So if you're watching Mark, I apologize. I caught it a little too late. But, you know, again, a really, really fun book. They're, they're a little bit of work and generally they sound a little bit bigger on a, on a larger instrument. Uh, most of the arrangements, you know, call for trumpets and and reeds and some strong pedal uh, stops. So just something to keep in mind um, as a way to to hit some of those festival hymns. Another favorite composer who I'm really obsessed with is Marianne Kim, and uh, like John Benke's collection, this is a digital collection of 18 hymns where again she's cr she's created a version for every verse of the hymn so it might have the first verse in the standard form then she jazzes it up a little bit for the second verse and then here comes a modulation and it really it really gets interesting for that final verse as you whip it all out um really really great stuff i i used for Christmas, all of her her Christmas arrangements. Uh, I have no deal with Marianne or any of the composers, but these are ones that I just really love and recommend highly. Some more that that I've run across. Um, I'm not I'm not RLDS or Mormon, and uh, really don't know a whole lot about uh, the music tradition within that faith. Uh, I, we know that it's a community that we really want to reach out to because there are a lot of of volunteer and part-time organists in, in the various uh, RLDS stakes. And I ran across this book uh, by Brent Jorgensen that's very similar to the others. It's It's got those variations and some modulations and some nice introductions. And they're, they're all for RLDS 
uh, tunes. So if if you do play in play in, in the Mormon Church, this is could be a great resource for you. Another fun one, "Sing Thy Grace" from Patrick Alston. A um, uh, lot a lot of gospel arrangements in this, and they they swing they're really great. Nice harmonies. Uh, Patrick's going to be leading the African American service at the San Francisco AGO convention this summer, and uh, I, I would encourage you look him up on YouTube because he just he just does some beautiful arrangements, uh, especially of the gospel tunes. Another another piece that I've used probably for thirty years is called the Organizer from Lorenz, and all the main thing in this book is it has all the all the transpositions. So if if you want to go from a song in G flat major to a, a different selection in the key of B flat or B or D or whatever it is, they're they're all right there. And they're able to they're able to provide a, a reference point if you need to shift uh, between two hymns, for instance, or you want to shift from a uh, anthem or, or to a, an organ voluntary. Um, there's also a feature in there called All Roads Lead to the Doxology. So no matter what you're playing for that that offertory, it makes it very easy if, if your church uses the doxology uh, to present the offering, it, it takes you right into to the doxology. It's fantastic. And then finally, in this section, uh, Noel Ra Rosthorn, and he's probably a familiar name, uh, especially for those of you that uh, maybe play in Episcopal churches. Uh, this is the 200 last verses. He's got uh, versions of, of this book, I think, for manuals only. Um, again, you know, very big arrangements. There are you know, lots of big chords. Um, they may or may not be right for your services, but uh, I think that they're they're very exciting and and grand and and it, it really does give your hymns that sense of the cathedral, so it's worth checking out as well. And then a couple more resources that uh, I'd love to share with you: St. James Music Press. Now we tend to think of St. James Music Press as really being a, a source for choral music. It's a subscription, and you buy the subscription, and then you have the ability to download. You know, all the choral music you need for that year, but there's there are a lot of organ works on there too, and and some worship worship aids there. So check that out, and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to sign you up. I just got an email today from them uh, pointing out their organ works, uh, so worth checking out. And then also the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians has a an online library that you can pull down that includes a lot of hymn variations as well. So those, those traditional hymn tunes, it's, they, there's some nice last verses or some nice quiet verses. And so that's a great place to, to check out, especially if you play in, in a Lutheran church. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about number three. And I think number three is probably, in my mind, is the most challenging. That's why I put it in the middle, you know, kind of the mountain. Um, have you considered getting AGO certification? And there are two two levels that mo many of us probably would be be most suited for, or possibly um, one is the service playing certificate, and that uh, happens. It's it's basically an October to March cycle. So this March will be the end of the the 2023 cycle, and then it'll start again in October. But Here's the great thing: the test measure. The test includes repertoire, hymn playing, sight reading, accompanying, some transposition, harmonization, and modulation. But here's the good news: is there's a great study guide, and there's also a monthly Zoom study group. So if you think that you that this might be something you'd like to pursue, um, there's a lot of support there to help you achieve that, and. Uh, and I, I hear that the Zoom group is going great. And uh, so it might be worth checking out. And you can go to agohq.org slash certification to find the, the exact repertoire requirements. I believe you have a choice of you have a choice of several different options in each category. And then the other one is the colleague certificate. And this is one I've I've put it in print. That this is something I'm pursuing this year. That's a that's a good way to hold yourself accountable because um, you know I certainly hope that come next January 
you know, I've got that hanging on my wall because I, I put it out there. And this one works a little bit differently. It, they, they do recordings um, twice a year, once in March, mid-March, and the other time in mid-November. And you can see this, the cost is about $200 uh, for both sections, uh, 150 if you're a student. But you can also, you can also divide it up. You can take, the, you can take uh, the, the two sections separately if you like. And again, you know, this is measuring basic repertoire, hymn playing, sight reading, accompanying transposition. Um, in the case of the colleague, the, I've picked uh, William Mathias's uh, processional as as one of my pieces if you're familiar with that and there's a Brahms chorale prelude and then that C major prelude and fugue by Bach that I shared with you a little bit earlier um, you know that really helped me to get started it, it's been many many years since I've tackled a, a somewhat major work of Bach like that and so um, you know again and just a, a great place to go for this is is Vetus's Secrets of Organ Playing because he he has videos that demonstrate how to harmonize scales and and harmonize tunes and again there's that music that's that's already been fingered out for me so I I hope that that you might consider doing that it's a, a you know a real sign of personal accomplishment uh, to to complete one of the AGS certifications and. Um, you know, give it a go. If, if you think that's something you might be interested in doing, drop that in the chat too, or, or let me know. You know, it's, it's always great to have someone to support and cheer on and, and hold each other accountable. So I hope that's one that you may consider. Okay, here's my favorite. Plan and present a recital. I, I can see the eyes rolling. I can't do a recital. But I got news for you. You don't have to have Vidor and Vierne symphonies in your repertoire. You don't have to have big, big works. Um, put together an entertaining program. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times people just enjoy sitting and listening to the organ. And I, you know, I mean, yes, you can tell with your ear if something's really super complicated, but but most people aren't attuned to that. They're looking, they're looking for something that's going to be entertaining, something that's going to show off the instrument. And there are plenty of opportunities for you to do this, and and in in very subtle ways as well. It doesn't have to be I'm I'm giving a recital on Sunday at two p.m. And please come, you know, work it into a community event. Um, does your community have an art walk? Well, maybe maybe ask the organizers to include your church on that on the itinerary for the art walk and and uh, be playing and invite people to have a seat and enjoy. My church has a monthly bazaar, and uh, apparently some of the folks have gotten used to me showing up and practicing on Saturday mornings, and. Uh, so it becomes a, a little bit of a recital uh, for people that really came out to to look through the knickknacks and all the the stuff in the parking lot. But at some point they go inside for refreshments and the bathrooms, and they discover the organ. And uh, same thing goes for festivals. Does your community have a a, a Daisy Festival or a I, I don't know. I mean, every city kind of has that festival. If your church is kind of along in the area, why not open up at that time and play play for that and offer that as entertainment? You know, it, it's funny because people are not as churched as they used to be. And so there's a lot of curiosity there. And I think we have to give them a, an excuse to, to get curious about the organ. They may just be surprised. And uh, that's where that's where the next suggestion really comes into play. You know, pick music you can't normally play on Sunday. That's that's a great incentive for your folks, your fans in the congregation that that love your preludes and your offertories and your postludes every week. Pick some things that you can't work into that service. Uh, maybe longer works. Pick play that whole partita that uh, that runs ten minutes and and showcases your organ, but there's no way to work it into that service. Uh, Folk tune arrangements and popular music, uh, lots of lots of great ideas there. You know things that are that are different. You know, get a little jazzy or a little show tune. Um, holidays and special occasions, another great opportunity. Um, you know, we we tend to go two ways, I think, in terms of in terms of sort of 
holidays in the church. And uh, you know, 4th of July is kind of one of those ones that's, you know, it's, it's, you know, some churches are very much, you know, separation of church and state, so to speak. But in other traditions, uh, it's, it's, it's very much a part to, to, to do some of those patriotic hymns. But it, if, whether you can do that on Sunday near 4th of July or Memorial Day or Labor Day or Veterans Day, um, it's a great excuse to put together a program. And maybe, maybe you include some of those hymns that people love to sing, America the Beautiful, God of Our Fathers, uh, America, My Country, Tis of Thee, and then, and then fit in some patriotic, uh, patriotic-themed um, uh, organ voluntaries in the course of the program as well. Uh, great, great way to to explore some new music that you wouldn't normally play and get it polished. And uh, you know, again, take advantage of the hymn festival format. Again, people people love to sing. I I I just don't believe I we we got to make them sing. But I I think people like to sing, especially when they're those familiar tunes. So think about think about ways to to work that in. Make it fun. Bring in guest soloists. Do sing alongs. But in, in all of this, I mean, it, it really is something that you can do with our SMART objectives. Here, here are some of the themes that I just, I sat down and, and thought up, you know, our holidays, you know, Mother's Day, patriotic, Halloween. Uh, does your chapter do a Halloween concert every year? If, if they're not doing one, then do one at your church. Uh, uh, at my church, I did it for several years and it was about 20 minutes long. And that's a great length for the little kids invite them to come in their costumes and maybe do the funeral march of the marionette and have them do a parade through the through the sanctuary. I mean, lot, lots of creative ideas and, and the music's not that hard, but but it's all about the experience. Uh, and of course, Christmas, um, sacred and secular. Uh, uh, I've, I've discovered over the years that the uh, White Christmas, Irving Berlin's you know, monumental Christmas anthem sounds great on a pipe organ. And of course, when it was composed, it was played on a pipe organ a lot. Um, you know, just a just a great fun way to to uh, introduce music into the organ. Hail Britannia, do a program of English folk tunes. Uh, there are a lot of great hymns in there, lots of great, great arrangements. Uh, maybe Broadway or movie themes. Uh, you can take uh, there. There's some sort of simplified organ versions of many of those, or you know, work with a piano arrangement and turn it into an organ piece. Do a program hooked on classics, and pull out all of your favorite tunes: The Swan, uh, Sanson, and uh, Ave Maria, and and all of those favorite ones. And then uh, another idea: if if you want to stay with a, a religious theme, do a hymn festival for the entire liturgical year. Start with start with Advent and work your way through Christmas and Epiphany and Pentecost and Easter and Pentecost and and pull out arrangements of all those favorite hymns that that folks love to sing over and over and over. And the great thing again, it fits with our smart our smart principles. It's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. You can do that. This I can't think of a better excuse to practice than to put together something really fun like this and get my congregation involved. And the last of, of the five ideas is find a practice partner. I mean, sometimes sometimes practicing it, it, you know, long hours in the in the church, maybe it's at night and the lights are all off and you're kind of lonely. Um, you know, we all have our have our our little routines, but um, Find somebody to work towards one of those smart resolutions. Maybe maybe a pianist. Work on organ and piano duets. Duo organists. There are a lot of pieces, arrangements, and original compositions for two organists on one console. And uh, you know, if you think of the octopus, that's exactly what it is. Uh, uh, Raymond and Elizabeth Chenault have a fantastic arrangement of the Stars and Stripes Forever for organ duet and. Um, the first time I did it as a duet, uh, I had the choir director with me at the church that I was at at the time. She just started organ, but by golly, she pulled it off, and uh, we had people clapping along and standing up. So, it, you know, think think of fun ways to to make practice fun and and still learn new music. Uh, organ and instrumentalist or a soloist, whether that's a vocalist or a, maybe you have a great 
uh, harpist. You know, I, I only have three in my church choir, but of all things, I have a professional harpist. So uh, we try, we try, and I think we need to make a resolution of that as well to to do more organ and harp arrangements. But but make it fun, and uh, you know, practice is never that bad when you're when you're having fun. And to keep with our smart resolution, plan to perform. You know, set set that goal. You know, that special worship service, whether it be Easter or Good Friday, Pentecost, Thanksgiving, maybe. You know, whatever whatever uh, you work for, set that. Um, you can you can perform together on that recital. Um, that's always a fun a fun treat as well. So maybe you and your practice partner can take those pieces and and do one of those recitals that we talked about in number four. And then, of course, uh, the last one at, at a community event. I mean, maybe there's maybe there's an opportunity in your community to to perform, or you can uh, take advantage of some of those events that are happening right around you. Those art walks to perform. And here's here's a great resource that I think applies across the board as well, and it's also a great AGO member benefit. Uh, as an AGO member, you can get a $35 discounted annual membership to the Church Music Institute. And um, the Church Music Institute has a huge collection of choral music and organ music. And it, it's an actual library. I mean, they, they, have, they have actual archives, but but they're in the process of digitizing the works. And so you, you're able to go into their website, and, and this shows some of the sample fields that you can use to look look up um, pieces, uh, you know, from tune name, title, composer, uh, editor difficulty, whether it has instruments, uh, uh, manuals only. That's going to be a good one for for our next webinar in April. And here's the one that I love. If you've ever gone and looked for a piece on IMSLP. Sometimes that can be a rabbit hole, uh, just trying to get in there and sort of find that certain work by Max Rager and and uh, or whoever Chopin and and he didn't really do organ music, but but you know you know where there where there are so many so many works that are now in the public domain and and the CMI database the search allows you to search. Uh, those pieces that are in the collection and are also available in IMSLP. And I'll just throw out one piece with this. Um, if you find if you find the work that you're you're looking for there, you can you can look at it. if it's been scanned and digitized. You can you can look at look at it there. And then if it's something that you're interested in, if you email them, they'll send you uh, they'll send you by email a copy of that piece uh, that you can use now. And I will say that that it's your responsibility to, to do right by the copyright laws. So, um, you know, especially, especially with the choral works, you know, you can't just sort of request a copy and then go make 20 copies of it. But, uh, but it's a great way to look at, look at the pieces, especially some of those things that, that maybe are out of print and no longer on the publisher's sites. So it's it's a great great resource, and uh, as an AGO member, again, you you save a, a little chunk of change on your membership, and so I hope you'll check it out as well. And just a reminder, you know, as you as you go through this year and you start to think about this, and you think about what you'd like to achieve, you know, don't just settle for practice more. Let's let's think about being specific, measurable achievable, relevant, time-bound. You know, th apply that to your resolutions. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. You know, maybe if, if, if you feel up to it, go into the chat. Now that we've talked about a bunch of ideas, throw, throw out your, your smart resolution for the year. And I think it's sort of fun to see what others are thinking about. And you, know, you may find that, that some of you have, share the same resolutions or similar ones, or you might get a great idea for one that you'd like to you'd like to pursue as well. I mean, part of, part of why I'm really enjoying the weekend organist the most is because we're building a community, and uh, you know, in this post pandemic world, you know, a lot a lot of churches have struggled. A lot of our AGO chapters have struggled a little bit to get back to to where we were before the pandemic. 
And so, so we're trying to build a community here and you'll find that on our AGO Facebook page and in the AGO Oregon forum. And so uh, don't, don't be afraid to, to share your thoughts and uh, see, what, see what you come up with. You know, a couple, couple of things coming up just to, to get the juices flowing too. February is Black History Month. Uh, so maybe maybe one of your resolutions could be to incorporate a piece by an African American composer into a service. Um, many of us are are very much aware of Florence Price, Adolphus Hale Stork. I just got a great collection of spiritual arrangements that he did. David Hurd, another contemporary uh, composer who's very much uh, active. Uh, you, there are also several volumes of the African American Organ Music Anthology. Uh, edited by Mickey Thomas Terry. So the, those are those are some great resources you know, if you'd like to make that a part of your resolution this year. And another one coming up in March, March 10th is Woman Composer Sunday. And this is a this is a pretty big initiative from the AGO this year. Uh, we're working really hard. Uh, if you've seen your January issue of TAO, the American Organist, you saw that there was a, a work published in there by Elizabeth Sterling, a 19th century English composer. And the fun part of this is we're actually following, we're following up in February and March with two more publications. They're all super accessible. Um, the one in February is by Dr. Roberta Bitgood, who's a for, the, she was the first female president of the AGO. And it's a chorale prelude on the tune Children of the Heavenly Father. It's just, just beautiful. And then in March, uh, we have an arrangement of Let Us Break Bread Together. So if you're in one of those churches that does communion every week, that's going to be one that'll be very helpful to you uh, to, to pull out, you know, to, to keep things fresh for communion time. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that we'll, we'll be having a webinar in, and I believe it's the second Monday in February, uh, talking about Woman Composer Sunday and sharing some ideas and repertoire. And I hope that you'll plan to join us for that. Okay, so I, I teased you a little bit with this earlier. Uh, at our last weekend organist webinar, uh, everyone said, we we want to talk about music for manuals. So that's what we're going to do on Monday, April the 8th. So mark your calendars. And this is going to be one where we're going to, we're going to work with recordings and, and maybe even some live, uh, live uh, demos of some of the pieces that we're going to look at. Uh, uh, just we're going to look at classics, contemporary, romantic. Uh, and uh, so I think those will be great resources for you and your music ministry. So save the date for that. And y'all you know, want to say something real quick too. I mean, just just because you don't use a lot of a lot of pedal doesn't mean anything less. Because, you know, so, so often, you know, playing on the manual, so I mean it's a whole different texture to the music and and it showcases the instrument in a different way. So so for those of you that maybe maybe stick to the manuals, it's okay. Um, there's great music, there's good quality repertoire, and uh, it's, it's perfectly okay. And that's something that we can maybe find a smart resolution for you to, to continue to work on those skills. And if you're going to be in San Francisco for the National Convention, we're actually going to do a reading session and have some networking opportunities. So I hope if you're planning on attending uh you know, look, look up the session. I, I'm not sure. I think it's on Thursday, um, but I'll double check and uh, on Thursday morning. But uh, do plan to join us. It'll be a great chance. We'll be talking about repertoire uh, for the for the weekend organist and for, and for that small program. And uh, the great news is is that the registration for the conference is very very affordable. It's uh, it's the lowest in many years, and it includes the transportation package as well. Uh, so so don't pass up on that. And if you register before January thirty first, you can save a hundred dollars as well with the super saver rate. So look in look into it now. The hotel is one hundred sixty nine dollars a night, and uh, that's just a an unbelievable rate for for a prime location in San Francisco. So make it a vacation, and come join us there. And then 
I think this is my last public service announcement. Um, for those of you that may be looking for a, a new church position, uh, the Committee on Career Development and Support is planning a special webinar just for you next Tuesday. Note that's Tuesday, not a Monday. Typically we're on Mondays, but this is next Tuesday. You got the interview, now what? And they're really going to touch on those issues that, that tend to be challenging in interviews. They're going to do some scenarios with those tough questions and, and give, you, uh, give you some strategies to go into that interview and land that dream job that you've always been thinking of. So mark your calendars for that. There'll be, there'll be some emails going out in the next week to remind you to register. But uh, again, an example of, of AGO really trying to, to answer the, the requests of, of members who are looking for different types of professional development and career development training. So I hope that you'll join us if that's, if that's something that's of interest. And then finally, before I go, um, if you haven't had a chance to do the survey today, uh, please please save the link. We'll also send it out when we send the recording. And we have a, a free work, uh, once again, from John Dixon. Uh, if you've met John, he's, he's fabulous. John's the treasurer of the AGO, but he's also a, a recitalist. He's trying to hit uh, every one of the 50 states with a recital. So if your chapter is interested, uh, don't be shy to reach out. But he's provided... Um, free works for us as a part of this series. And I thought the perfect one, he did a he did a postlude on America the Beautiful. And I thought that's the perfect one for today because we were talking about patriotic recitals. So um, we'll send that out along with the link to the recording and also the link to take that survey. Um, please, please do though, take a moment to fill that out if you can. Um, it'll help us to, to determine what topics are important to you. Um, in terms of our, our webinars and the column and, and the other ways. And it'll also give us more information. Uh, you know, for 60% of the What, what your working conditions are like. And, and I mean, you know, we ask things like, how many Sundays do you get off a year? And so... Anyway, uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. I want to thank Dan McCaffrey again for being our, our support behind the scenes. Uh, if, you have, if you've never had the opportunity to speak to him, call the office because he's the voice of the AGO, as our executive director, James Thomas Shower, likes to say. Um, just a really fantastic new addition to the team. And, and again, don't, don't be afraid to reach out if you have questions or would like to make suggestions. Um, we're, we're here to listen to you and, and see what we can do to, to support you and your music ministry. So happy new year, get out there, write those, write those resolutions, but more importantly, keep them. And we'll see everyone again in April for music for manuals. Good night.